Is that good? Can everybody see? Yeah, we see you loud yeah. and clear. Oh, it looks good, okay. Ben. So um, I uh, wanted to talk today about uh, balancing treatment needs uh, with patient individuality. And I feel like this is um, a topic that is, I don't know if brush to the wayside is a good way to put it, um, but I feel sometimes it's not focused on a lot because um, whether we are a dentist or um, a dental technician or a denturist, we sometimes get pigeonholed or um, caught up in the hype of a certain product, um, certain way of doing things. Um, we get caught up in finances that we all have, financial responsibilities and commitments. Um, so to keep this kind of, you know, big picture look can sometimes be difficult. And um, this is something that um, we try to do at the, at the lab that I work at here. Um, we, um, yeah, I work at a, a small uh, family independent owned uh, dental laboratory, Mueller's Dental Arts Lab in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. This is our lab there. And uh, we uh, take uh, things from, um, start to, to finish truly in the sense that every single technician that works with us, we are um, for technicians, we work from the beginning to end on the case, um, which of course allows us to really hone in to um, the nuances of each individual case and uh, put our own artistic spin on it. Every tooth of course is individual and unique. Every case is unique, every patient is unique. and uh, to remember this is always important. Um, we, when we get a case, we always um, are in very close contact with our dentist that we currently work with. Um, it's a relationship thing that builds um, over time. And uh, of course, uh, we can tailor our um, work protocol with each client because of that, um, depending on if they are more analog based or more digital based or a combination of the two. And uh, so generally when we get a case in, um, we um, not only does the patient have a consultation with the dentist, but we also um, a lot of the times have a consultation with the patient. Because sometimes, and whether it's a local um, dentist that we work with, or a um, dentist that's abroad or across the country, um, sometimes information that the patient passes on to the dentist does not filter through to us. So it's always nice for us to either be able to see the patient in the lab, um, taking notes down, um, just getting to know the patient, or um, for example, when it's abroad and um, via things like this, you know, like a, a webinar obviously, but through Zoom or um, video streaming services, so that we get to know the patient and, and get to see what um, they want and what their expectations are. Um, because ultimately, um, it doesn't matter what I want to create or what you know the dentist wants to create sometimes from an aesthetic point of view you know the patient is the one who is walking around with it long term and we are um, basically the the team that has to guide them through the process of the restoration whether it's one unit or a full mouth um, and try to give them what will serve them the best the longest um, without something that will break down you know within one two three four five years um, should ideally last them a long, long time since they are spending a lot of money on it. Um, so when we take colors, we, um, as you saw in the uh, previous one here, you know, whether it's a single tooth or whether it's multiple teeth, uh, we take a shape map. And depending on what ceramic system we use, we'll write down the powders that we see in different areas, um, whether it's crack lines or more chromatic areas that are colorful. Um, more translucent areas. Um, what we will also sometimes do for certain cases is we will do uh, diagnostic wax ups. Um, we do simple diagnostic wax ups that are just out of one color, or like you see here, we do aesthetic wax ups. And uh, this is all wax. And we do this so that we can show the patient already a bit more visually what things can look like. And this is all part of that preliminary diagnostic process where um, we basically can exchange information between the patient and the dentist and give them an idea of what things can look like. And they can give us their feedback um, of if they like it or not. This happened to be a new case. Um, so. 
materials are one of those things where um, they are, we have a lot of materials that are available to us, um, especially nowadays with digital on the market. Things um, are getting, I find, sometimes very overwhelming, even for myself, to figure out exactly what material to use for what. Within a certain material category, you know, there's honestly sometimes hundreds of options, especially when you're talking about zirconia or, or metals, um, of what you can use. And uh, things are improving so fast and evolving so fast and coming to the market so fast that it's uh, truly difficult sometimes to, to know what to use. So I thought I'd um, kind of talk a little bit about four different topics today that I picked that we use in the lab here predominantly. Um, being metal alloys, zirconia, polymers, and lithium disilicate. And of course, when you look at a case, um, you may want to pick one um, material right off the bat just because you're more inclined to using it because you're used to it or because it's easy or because it's cost effective. But that might, material might not always be what's best for the patient long term. And so there are many ways to build something. For example, the wall there you know you can have something out of plastic um you have something out of stone it all works but um of course has different characteristics in terms of strength and um elasticity for example and also aesthetics you know the artistic side of things starting with metal alloys obviously for i'm going to do this really simple um I'm not going to go too deep into material science today, and just because you know I don't want to bore you guys either. But um, is it an alloy, right? Is a is a metal that's made of a combination of at least two or more metallic elements to basically achieve certain um, characteristics, whether it's more strength, um, more elasticity, um, more um, also for example swagability. So for um, example, when you're talking about um, gold crowns. I jumped ahead here. And when you talk about gold crowns, for example, and some alloys are softer than others, um, so they can have disadvantages or, or, or advantages depending on um, what's um, required in the case. And just because, you know, metal alloys may not be so um, used anymore nowadays when it comes to, for example, PFM crowns, it doesn't mean that they are a bad option. And just because it's old, <laughs> Um, doesn't mean it's it's bad. Um, this was a little bit uh, a personal thing here. This is um, a cabin we used to go to a lot. Fortunately, burned down in the winter sometime by somebody. But it was a sweet cabin, and um, it uh, was over a hundred years old, and just stood the test of time. And this goes to show that all materials, whether they're on the outside. On the inside, they still work and they can still be beautiful and depending on your perspective and they can work great. And honestly, sometimes old school things can last longer than some of the new materials that are out on the market. Doesn't mean that the new materials are bad. It just means that um, depending on the situation at hand that the patient sometimes comes in with, um, you know, it might be the, the choice to go. Um, so, you know, whether it's, you know, a high gold content alloy um, or a low gold content alloy, um, like the, the white gold there, or whether it's titanium. And, you know, the titanium that we use in, in the dental industry, there is not pure titanium, and they are an alloy as well. And whether they are, you know, for example, in implants or titanium components or tie bases, or whether we use a titanium alloy in the, um, bars um, that we might do for bridge work or full arch cases um, or single units. Those are all alloys. Um, for example, gold onlays or inlays or gold crowns um, or PFM crowns that have high gold content where maybe from an aesthetic point of view you might do some buckle layering with ceramic um, even wrapping into the occlusal maybe because it some people might have this Julia Roberts smile, right? That is really wide and um, some patients are aesthetically um, inclined even in the posterior. So then you can do things like that. And the nice thing with um, metal alloys is that when you have little space um, available to you um, for whatever reason, 
uh, whether you did not prep enough, let's say as a clinician, um, or there's a strong bite. You know, metal alloys, they are super durable and they will not crack um, or um, just, you know, shear off, for example, a gold crown. You know, it's, it's there to stay. And you know, these, these restorations, when done well, they'll, they'll last you a long, long time and they'll last the patient a long time. You know, you have, you know, these type of restorations that are 30 plus years in the mouth. And I know that a lot of uh, clinicians that are listening here and today who have maybe been at it a long, long time, they can speak to that as well, that they are just great restorations that last the patient a long time. This is a PFM bridge, for example, so a metal framework layered with um, with porcelain. So this kind of stereotype that uh, a PFM bridge or PFM crown looks awful because you know there's a metal substructure underneath that needs to be blocked out somehow, and then you can't put proper ceramic on it because it won't look good. I mean, this is all um, a little bit depending on the um, person who makes the restoration, um, and so of course it for you as dentists, it's important to partner with people um, that, you know, A, don't cut corners and, and you know, quite frankly, know what they're doing um, so that you get the desired results that will serve the patient best in the long term. Zirconia um, is another interesting material. And of course, uh, as the industry evolved, uh, metal alloys, um, also got more expensive and this hunt for um, all ceramics or non-metal and restorations kind of started and um, zirconia being one of them and um, zirconia is actually um, um, based on it's a metal oxide it comes from zirconium which is a metal and um, you know we see it uh, in many applications um, from jewelry you know where we have clear zirconias you know these synthetic um, cubic zirconias to of course crowns and for the form of dental restorations and uh, zirconia has come a long way um, when it first came out it was very opaque uh, very ivory looking and very dead looking of course this has improved greatly now now we have all kinds of zirconias available to us um, and it seems like every couple of months there's a new one coming out of the market in terms of um, improved aesthetics in terms of um, a variety of um, material characteristics, whether it's less strength, but more aesthetics or higher strength, less aesthetics or a combination of the two, um, more translucency. And these are all things that are um, available to us nowadays. And um, it's becoming almost, I find dentists are to need, need to do, on top of all the homework they already do in CD, um, it's becoming more technical for everybody involved because there's simply so much out there um, and if you don't do a little bit of homework and figuring out what um, is out there, you cannot serve your patients properly. And then, of course, you just keep asking for the same material over and over, and um, you never are able to tap into the, the fantastic resources that are out there in terms of new materials that are possibly better. Um, so zirconia is nice because it is very hard. Um, it's a tooth-colored material. Um, so, of course, for patients who, right off the bat, for example, don't want a gold crown, Zirconia is great because A, it's hard, it's durable, it's tooth colored, and uh, also um, a nice um, option with it is that when you also have less space, I should say, um, not as little as with, let's say, um, you know, a, a gold crown, for example, where you can really get away with prepping very little, but um, because zirconia is so strong, we can make it quite thin still and not have to layer. So we can do monolithic restorations, um, that are very cost effective. Monolithic meaning that it's all out of one material. It's not, there's nothing layered to it, like for example with a metal ceramic crown where you have the metal framework and then ceramic layered to it. Um, so um, they can be a great um, alternative to, to gold crowns or basically areas um, or scenarios where the patient requires high strength um, and yet be durable and, and tooth colored. Um, on top of it just being, you know, a tooth color material, you can layer it as well and you can achieve fantastic aesthetics with it um, in the anterior zone. <clears throat> it comes in, um, you know, Jeff Sumner might want to, or can talk about this more too, and I, as far as I know, he has talked about this a little bit already, 
And you know, if you mill chair side, you know, it comes in block form and the zirconia, you can also get it in the pack form or various shapes depending on the mill that you have. So um, this is the other thing, you know, the, the how should I say, the things and fundamentals that we learned from metal ceramic based restorations, they still apply to, to zirconia. It's just that this is now basically fusing the knowledge of the old with the technology of the new and being able to design things digitally and then have the machine mill it out and, um, <coughs> and then um, go and uh, apply the handcraft to it um, after the machine spits it out. Um, also, these um, materials that I will throw up here now in terms of, for example, there's a Katana Zirconia block and the Amangirbach um, solid zirconia. The, I'm not sponsored by any of these companies. These are just examples I put out to maybe just um, broaden some of your horizons and show you some materials that are great <clears throat> and I've heard that are great. For example, we use the Amangirbach and zirconia a lot, um, the multi-layer one. Um, but it's not like a, you know, an advertisement for it. It's just things that maybe are not so mainstream always and um, that do work great because you know, if no one tells you that they exist, you don't know that they exist. <coughs> Lithium basilicate is another um, material in that category of all ceramics. <coughs> and um, if you excuse me, I just have to get a glass of water, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it's a glass ceramic, and uh, basically it's in that all ceramic category as well. Like, well, it's lumped in that category of you know tooth-colored materials that we can use to uh, make restorations. Um, it is a uh, basically glass ceramic. It's a chemical compound that's produced through melting and cooling of silicate minerals, and uh, the nice thing about that is that um, we can mill it <coughs> and we can also press it. So um, whether we have a mill you know, in the lab for, you know, for us lab technicians or you have a, have a chest mill in, in your office, you can mill it. But um, the nice, um, I personally um, like the pressing uh, option the best. Because um, with pressing, it's really a little bit this um, uh, really tapping into the old school of um, being able to design things still by hand if needed. Um, you can also design things ca uh, with CAD, with digital, um, and have it milled out in wax. But the nice thing is that what um, then becomes invested and burned out in the furnace, um, you, you get back one to one, whereas with milling, for people who have experience with milling, um, sometimes what is designed doesn't always come back out on the other end um, due to certain um, milling limitations, software limitations, um, the burrs that do the milling and their limitations. And so um, I feel like it's a nice fusing of old and new school um, with the uh, pressing this uh, material and uh, being able to really tap into the individuality and uniqueness of the teeth that each patient has, um, whether it's very defined fissures or certain anatomies or certain surface textures. You know, all these things a lot of time get lost in, in the mill. And so with pressing, all these things become um, possible. The other nice thing with um, lithium bisilicate is that you can truly bond it in place. So when you have, for example, a prep that has a bad retention profile, um, or it just doesn't have a lot of, you know, a, for example, so conical pyramid type of um, prep, or it simply doesn't have a lot of vertical height to it. Bonding is nice um, because, um, a, you know, it will reduce the risk of it falling off down the road, um, i.e. Um, increasing the longevity of the restoration. And at the same time, um, it also, um, strengthens the entire restoration because bonding it in, truly bonding it in, 
creates, it becomes one basically with a two substructure, whereas for devil's zirconia, you cannot truly bond it in. Um, I know there are some things on the market now that say you can etch zirconia, but as far as I could find out, it's not a true etching, and it's more of a increasing the mechanical retention on the zirconia. Um, maybe there's people that might uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's as far as my understanding still, that you cannot truly etch zirconia, um, like you can lithium by silicate. Um, and on top of it with lithium by silicate, because then it becomes truly one unit with the crown, uh, with the um, tooth structure underneath, the light dynamics um, that are so important for creating high aesthetic cases um, are just mind blowing because the restoration truly starts to act as a natural, or more so act as a natural tooth would, um, where you know the pulp and the dentine from below and the tissues surrounding the tooth um, really have there's a true light interplay. And um, sometimes you don't have this so much, of course, with, for example, a metal ceramic crown or a zirconia crown because of the light blocking properties that metal obviously. Um, um, presents and sometimes certain zirconias as well. <clears throat> the fourth material I want to discuss um, uh, briefly is polymers and uh, in specifically pectin and so this is um, newer, I, I may be wrongly assume but I assume for most of you guys. Um, it's a molecular structure um, as well, a polymer, right? It's uh, basically um, something that's uh, fused together of very similar substances, for example, plastics. And so basically, it's a very fancy plastic, but it's used in all kinds of applications, <clears throat> whether it's, you know, airplane manufacturing, and, you know, these are all <clears throat> polymers, you know, this big metal or plastic too, I should say, that flies through the sky. And it's all glued together, you know, it's extremely um, strong, extremely rigid. But of course, like uh, as we know um, in, in aviation, um, certain um, elasticity or uh, yeah, elasticity and um, I don't want to say flex, but um, if the airplane was brittle, you know, the wing would snap off in turbulence. And um, so, of course, it, there needs to be certain give to it. And um, pectin gives us this. And um, it's a nice material to use. Um, we predominantly use it for. Uh, implant frameworks um, of a large manner and so you know full arches um, half arches and um, we've done it on single units as well but where i find this material truly shines is in a full arch setting um, on implants where the where basically the aim is to protect um, the implants that have been placed and we all know that um, Zirconia is used a lot on full arches. Not saying that it's wrong, um, but in my um, humble opinion, I feel like a pectin framework, or for that matter, even a titanium framework, if you do need more rigidity, is a better way to go long term um, in a lot of cases. Simply because zirconia, for example, um, is very strong, it can have great aesthetics, yes, um, but at the same time, it's also not shock absorbing. So all the stresses that uh, happen when a patient is chewing, um, biting together, clenching, um, this all gets transferred to the implants. And long term down the road, I mean, we have seen in the lab, you know, these type of cases that have been in the mouth <clears throat> five plus years, they all start to come back with problems, whether it's um, ceramic that has been partially layered onto the zirconia framework that has chipped off, or whether it's the actual zirconia that has broken um, because maybe it wasn't fitting passively in the mouth or um, the zirconia was strong enough, but all of a sudden we're starting to get peri-implantitis around implants and the implants are starting to fail. So of course this uh, hunt for try to try to improve things is always there and um, pectin and titanium subsequently too are simply um, the materials that are closer to um, the compressive strength characteristics, let's say, of um, what we have naturally in our body, for example. And in the diagram on the right, you can see um, how close pectin is 
in terms of um, its uh, E modulus, so it's basically its elasticity and yield strength to cortical bone and human dentine. <clears throat> so basically it's a safeguard between the forces that the patient generates and the implants that have been you know, placed compared to, you know, the zirconia uh, and uh, chrome cobalt, which of course is a very rigid hard metal. <clears throat> um, some of you might, in the diagram on the left in the upper corner, and some of you might be familiar with PEAK. So PEAK is also a high performance polymer. Um, it's similar, um, it's more elastic. So for people who have been uh, kind of maybe dabbling in metal free um, cast partials, for example, which I will not really get into too much, but that would be um, more a material for that simply because it's more elastic, whereas pectin is more rigid. Um, pectin you can mill and you can also press it. Um, although I have to say, I feel like the majority of people who do use it have vied to go more towards the pectin um, mill because it's simply, again, that fusion of um, designing things digitally, being able to mill it out and adjust by hand later things if you need to um, or not, and depending on how good your, your milling strategies are. Time. Okay. <clears throat> so to go over a few cases, um, just to illustrate different uses, um, this is a PFM case, so a metal ceramic case. This is a metal framework, three unit bridge. And we chose metal um, as a substructure in this case, um, laid with ceramic, of course, um, actually all the way around on this one, except for on the lingual, where the bite is very deep and tight. So There's very, very little room. Um, zirconia um, and lithium desilicate, for example, would have cracked. Um, so metal, again, there's that advantage of metal, good old metal. Um, and on top of it, a discolor preparation. So we did not have to fight so much the discoloration shining through, which always is a problem, or I should say an obstacle when it comes to ostromic restorations. Um, whether it's zirconia or lithium silicate, um, the prep underneath does always play a role. And you do not ever see the true final color of a ostromic restoration until it has been um, uh, inserted uh, for good and um, has rehydrated after a few days. Um, so with uh, PFM, of course, those are the advantages that you can block things out. And um, when when bite is tight, you know we can uh, use that and not have a, a, the fear of that thing. So the framework breaks. Um, and again, you know, it looks great. You know, it's not this opaque typical uh, PFM that uh, a lot of people know. There's another PFM case, <clears throat> another great application. Um, for example, this is a uh, compromised uh, case. Um, lower teeth are always challenging just because they're so small. Um, this implant was placed right in the center, which works great. But of course, because everything is so small and tiny, um, if one would have made a zirconia framework, for example, around a tie base or even and possibly on a custom abutment, um, which is always some, a lot of the times the more ideal way to go, the zirconia becomes very thin, um, or the lithium silicate for that matter. And so that can lead to future breaking of the case. And so we did a nice uh, metal ceramic um, framework, um, metal framework out of the high noble alloy, and then we layered that, and uh, this uh, patient is running around uh, Kicking now for a long time, chewing with us very happily. <clears throat> On to zirconia. Um, again, talking a bit about patient individuality and the needs of the case. Uh, this patient, although there is not a lot of severe wear in the natural dentition, um, the patient did clench a lot. And the um, request from the dentist was that we make something that is monolithic. And again, this uh, case illustrates nicely how far zirconias have come. This is a truly monolithic zirconia um, with a little bit of stain and, and glaze on top to um, spice things up a little bit. And uh, you know, we try to incorporate a little bit the um, rebelness, I'll say, <laughs> of the um, first molar on the other side. And this kind of mutation a little bit that happened there, we incorporated this into the um, molar in the bridge and kind of swung it around uh, backwards as well. And um, looks great in the mouth and quite honestly, from a functional point of view, you know, 
somebody who might not have a lot of experience might try to just squeeze in a completely normal molar in there. And um, but from a functional point of view, it would not have worked. And unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the opposing. But uh, this type of scenario, um, and also when we looked at the prep, you could see the original molar was like that. So there's no need to try to squeeze a case into certain parameters that we were taught by a book or by a school. Yes, we need to take those parameters to account, but um, still keep an open mind about the um, big picture of the case. <clears throat> this is a zirconia case as well. Um, it's a four unit case. Um, we chose zirconia in this case, and we could have easily done PFM as well. And cost was a concern though, um, since it's, uh, you know, it's not just a single unit, and there's an implant involved here and a pontic, and there's a lot of restorative space, um, especially where the pontic and the implant are, and um, would have been a lot of alloy, so it would have been a big charge, um, additionally to the patient. Um, on top of it, the one single crown <coughs> um, is uh, on top of a um, uh, discolored stump, basically it's a metal metallic stump underneath. So it goes to show that um, zirconia can also block that out, but the reason why we didn't choose PFM was again, the main thing being cost, but at the same time, um, but for example, you could have done something where you mixed, um, let's say did a single PFM crown to block the, the metal stump out, and then the rest could have been zirconia. But from a fabrication point of view, that can sometimes complicate things because the layering ceramics that go on top of these uh, frameworks for the restorations are um, different. And so mixing them sometimes um, by mistake when you're layering um, can cause disastrous effects that you have to start from scratch as a technician. And um, so just to keep things simple, we all kept the same um, substructure and um, chose the, simply the appropriate zirconia and one that's for more opaque. <coughs> Here's another picture, different light. And here you can see what has actually been done. So the one central was um, a single crown on a metal stump and even the root, you can see how discolored it is. Then the canine is an implant crown with a cantilevered lateral pontic. And the first bicuspid after the canine we did in full contour zirconia. Um, just go back so you can have a look at it. Patient individuality with this, this guy did not want a Hollywood smile. And um, obviously he would have gotten the rest of his teeth done as well. And he just wanted something that looks natural, serves him until, you know, he, uh, he says goodbye to the world and uh, um, just wants something that looks, looks nice and natural. And, and he gave us basically the green, green light to go as, a, as, um, as natural as possible. So you can see on the, on the lateral, you know, does my mouse show up? I don't know if there's like a pointer. Is it a pointer? Yeah, Ben, we can see your mouse. Yeah, okay. Um, so for on the lateral here, right, we even imitated um, composite fillings, or I, I imitated composite fillings. Um, and all the craze lines and cracks, some of them are a mixture of built-in crack lines, so internally layered, some of them are external. Um, the, uh, you know, grinding them in, like you can see, uh, is present in some of the other teeth here, teeth here. And, bit more rugged, um, rough surface indidentally, you know, basically fake plaque accumulation um, over time here. And so this one here is the, the full contour crown. Um, multitude of colors going on, but basically the case simply integrates because we picked up on enough characteristics that appear naturally that simply make the whole thing integrate. Whether it's a perfect match when you look at the centrals just by themselves individually, no, it's not a perfect match, but that's not the point. And um, no tooth is ever exactly the same. And um, whether you're trying to match a single central, like in the next case, or not, um, even this one is not a perfect match. Um, nothing is mirror image. And um, if you've ever been online and you've seen those uh, pictures or these funny face apps on Facebook where people, you know, take a picture of the side of the face and then flip it over, they look really weird. And it's the same thing with, um, with, uh, with teeth, you know, anything in our body, it's, it looks like they're the same, but they're not. And so we've kind of dubbed this term that we have to make our cases um, um, uh, symmetrically asymmetrical. 
you know? So there have to be enough characteristics that you pick up on, that you input into your restoration, but at the same time, um, it has to be subtle differences so that it doesn't look too picture perfect. So you can see here, this, this is the crown that I did. In the silicate, this was a really fun case. This patient we dubbed the vampire enthusiast. Um, this is a three unit uh, lithium bisilicate bridge that's been layered. So um, nice thing with lithium bisilicate is you can use it also for bridge frameworks um, up to three units in the anterior. Um, possibly sometimes going into the posterior depending on uh, your bite scenario, let's say. Um, this patient, uh, yeah, like Resident Evil and Underworld and all this kind of subculture of uh, vampires and really wanted this. He was so adamant about it. We, he was at the lab so many times, very adamant and signed all kinds of things to basically give us peace of mind that we were doing the right thing by giving him a vampire thing. Um, oddly enough, um, also from a functional point of view, it worked because on the side where you have the vampire thing, completely clears it in lat protrusion and protrusion. The other side, um, as you can see, has severe wear. So um, he had a trauma um, to his jaw when he was younger and basically um, presented to us now then with this um, situation where we were able to do this for him. So again, this was layered. <coughs> and this is a lithium bisilicate where it's monolithic. So just because it's a monolithic crown, whether it's a conio or lithium bisilicate, um, it doesn't need to look, I'm going to say, boring um, and, and fake, you know, and just because there's something that doesn't look so nice um, in front of it, being that bicuspid, doesn't mean that you have to um, copy that fakeness um, in, your, in your restoration. So we um, <clears throat> went ahead and copied nice shape, and this is what I mean, you know, with milling, would have never been able to get this type of detailed anatomy. Simply, um, a lot of times, not, not possible. Um, you can get close, very, very close. And yes, you can um, work it afterwards with your, with your um, hand skills. But um, why not right away, you know, off the bat, do it to pressed um, and wax things by hand if you can, or mill it out in wax and then alter the wax a little bit by hand afterwards um, before going to invest and press it. Um, the other advantage I find to pressing is, um, and maybe some people will disagree with me, but um, from all the things that I have read, it seems to be, and also from what I've seen live, um, so this is not really scientific data, um, but what I've seen come back, pressed crowns seem, oh, are, um, yeah, seem to be stronger um, than the milled lithium silicate version simply due to their um, structure um, so that it can be milled versus pressed. Um, and basically the process that it goes through and when you're building something and then crystallizing it and all that stuff. Um, doesn't mean that the milled one is, is worse, but um, you know, thinking back to you know when we did refractory crowns or veneers, um, those were, you know, it's phosphatic porcelain, you know, the material itself is maybe 90 megapascals, 100 megapascals, that's not very strong. But they last because they're bonded in well. And so again, it's how you handle the case. And what, what are the requirements of the case? So, um, yeah, that's that, what I have to say about that. <clears throat> There's another lithium bisilicate crown, um, single lateral. Um, we did a lithium bisilicate in this one because um, they wanted something that can be bonded in. And you can simply see, you know, after, um, once it's inserted, you know, you still see a little bit of blanching in the papilla there between the central and the lateral, but um, overall it's a fantastic and light dynamics and the crown works together as one with the uh, with the underlying substructure it works together with this tissues where it comes out of the emergence you can see how the pink integrates and shines into the shoulder the gingival third um, and and illuminates the tooth from within um, it's just a fantastic uh, type of restoration <clears throat> pectin case um, this is a Oh, and okay. um, this is a full mouth um, case and I'll kind of go through maybe a little bit faster here. Um, we did diagnostic setups again going back to patient individuality. These big cases it's not just you know just making teeth okay you, you are really recreating the face you know people have like this have either gone through a very traumatic experience 
and there's a huge psychological um, aspect um, to the treatment of these type of patients. Um, the biggest thing that I have come to learn is that if a patient doesn't feel comfortable, especially with cases like this, it doesn't matter how good it looks. Um, it doesn't matter what you tell them, what you try to sell them, um, they won't accept the case. So it's better to sit down in the beginning, rather have several consultations, make sure that the patient has peace of mind. And even if that means that you lose a little bit of money, <clears throat> but in the end, you know, you get paid back, you know, tenfold. Um, so um, basically we did a nice um, analog still, denture um, tooth setup. <laughs> After also doing a verify, verification check, as you can see up top, to verify, get a verified master cast so that things are passive. This is a long-term temp. This particular patient um, was wearing really badly made dentures for a long time because um, things weren't done properly. And she was also extremely collapsed and we did have to open her up a bit. And so um, she wore this uh, long-term temp. There's just a low one. We did one up too. Um, she wore this for 18 months and um, never broke. And it just goes to show that, you know, if you do things properly, things can, can last good time, especially um, if you have proper patient management. Um, once we got the verification that we can go ahead, um, blessing to go ahead, we started making, you know, digitally designing um, the frameworks based off of the verified setups and attempts. <clears throat> Here are the pectin frameworks that have been milled based off of the CAD CAM design. And uh, this illustrates nicely that pectin, uh, the other advantages that they can be used for removable cases. Um, for these kind of, I call these fixed removable bridges in a way, um, because they truly feel fixed in the mouth, but um, simply removable by the patient. And um, because pectin is a polymer, um, it's extremely light. So if this thing was done out of titanium, it would be quite heavy. Um, see the intimate fit of the... Uh, locator style, these are locator style and attachment systems. This is um, people who are, might know of it. It's the Novalox system. And then um, the nice thing with pectin is you can bond to it. Um, it's extremely biocompatible. And, and uh, nice thing is, is that you can chemically wet it as well, the surface. So again, you can bond truly to it. So these are lithium disilica crowns on top of it that are bonded to the pectin framework. So it's not like having, let's say, a zirconia arch that has um, preps on it or, that, or metal arch that has preps on it where you're cementing this, um, zirconia crown so it works too, but it's not truly one unit, um, whereas this is. And um, it just um, becomes a stronger unit for it. And then everything gets finished off with, uh, by the way, these are monolithic lithium basilica crowns. Um, this was a cost decision. They did not want to um, spring the money for layered. So we did monolithic, but still looks great. And that's the nice thing with um, lithium and silicate. It usually has um, higher translucencies. Um, so things can look nicer from a monolithic point of view versus a lot of the zirconias. And things get finished off with the uh, pink composite. And that was the, was the fun case. The nice thing about these cases too, you know, um, they're extremely serviceable. So the tooth ever should crack, it's easy, you can either take it out if it's removable, put the long-term temp in that was made. Um, we can set up you know, a basically same day appointment with the lab and uh, get that tooth fixed. Or you basically, it turns into a crown and bridge case for you. You basically prep off the broken tooth, take a new impression, um, either digital or analog, and send it to the lab. And since we have everything digitized, we can just immediately get a new one uh, milled and send it back out to you and either we can bond it back on and fix things up or um, if you have guys have the skills or the gumption to um, bond it back and you guys can do it too. So it's not like with a zirconia case where if something cracks or breaks, you know, that's game over. You have to start from scratch. This is a case you know, that will last a long time. And yes, of course, it needs to be maintained and serviced, but these cases of this nature generally do anyway. It's a matter of trying to figure out what is the best course of action. This case is a full arch is the last one, um, a full arch case um, where we could have chosen pectin as well based off the strength <coughs> of things. 
but um, you can see already how thick the uh, the verification jig is. And honestly, the framework was pretty much that thickness, so it's thick enough for pectin. But the problem is that it was very compromised bone. Um, the spacing between the implants um, was a little bit on the questionable side for pectin, and the cantilevers and the distal cantilevers in terms of AP spread, and they were quite large. Um, with pectin, there are certain parameters that uh, we can talk about in a different uh, webinar, but um, it simply was too too long the cantilever, so we couldn't do that. And plus, the distal con um, implants are also zygomatic implants, so everything was very questionable um, with this case. We wanted to basically give the patient and you know everybody the re uh, restorative team peace of mind that things will not break in, uh, down the road. This is the uh, denture setup again. Long talks with the patient, diagnostic um, pictures before, nothing in the mouth, and denture set up in the mouth, um, tweaking things, rebuilding the face, rebuilding the oral architecture. Um, once things were verified, we proceeded with the digitization of everything. You can see just how much volume is to that framework. But again, um, you know, we almost have two units, two crowns with past the distal um, implant, and that's just too much for, for pectin. And also that cross arch gap between the two anterior implants. Um, those implants, I think, were 10 millimeter long implants. So again, incrustable bone. There's a radiograph you'll see in a minute here. So um, it's a compromised case, let's put it that way. So we did not want to use pectin on something like that. Pectin, so yeah. Titanium framework was finished, verified, everything fit passively, proceeded to making the frameworks. This um, patient wanted higher aesthetics, so we layered the anterior crowns. Posteriors were monolithic for strength. Cemented crowns on the titanium framework. This is a picture of the tissue six weeks after delivery. We did went with titanium straight to the tissue. Um, just because it's so nice and compatible. <clears throat> he is at rest with no restoration, at rest with restoration. So you can really see how we rebuilt the face, you know. And it's not, not too open. Um, she's starting to get, um, I've seen her again since, she's starting to develop that um, fuller lip again because the teeth are positioned in the right spot. Um, you know, wrinkles are starting to disappear because she's not collapsed inward. Because again, no restoration with restoration. Close up. So really, it doesn't matter if it's a single tooth or a full arch. You have to basically evaluate the criteria of the case and have a good talk with the patient, see what they want, what are their wishes. You know, do they want to look like a vampire? Do they uh, want a metal crown? Do they want uh, something that's tooth colored? Um, what can we give them? You know, is there enough space to do zirconia or um, lithium disilicate? Um, is it is the parameters for implants case where you want to use pectin ideally at first, um, but then it turns out you know there's not enough um, you know um, stability or rigidity in the case for whatever reason. Um, these are all things that you have to look at, and based on that you make your decisions for materials, and not based on. Um, what might be the easiest thing to do. Um, because again, we are not the ones who uh, are running around with it long term. So uh, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed it and that it was informative. And I thank you very much for taking the time to listen. And uh, this is the people, uh, or my family, I should say, who uh, motivate me to come in every day and try to make everybody smile. That was amazing, uh, Ben. Thank you, thank you for that talk. Um, just a few um, a few things to remember as well. So don't forget to type your name and email address uh, for the CE. Uh, also visit dtacademy.ca for any upcoming talks. All the videos, including Ben's talk, will be uploaded to the YouTube page and last week's episodes have been as well. So uh, follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn for all the latest information. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we have uh, Mr. Adam McCabe who will be talking to us about getting started with overdentures. Uh, followed by uh, Mark Chang, who will be talking about Digital Dentures Foundations 101. So register today at dtacademy.ca and the password to the events is TRACK20. That is all caps. On to you, John.
Yeah, let me unmute you. One sec. Yeah. There I am. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic, Ben. We uh, I really enjoyed that. The artistry that you showed was uh, was incredible. Did not disappoint. It did some incre incredible things. Uh, I knew that we were we were planning to see that. Your your knowledge of the different materials is incredible. And uh, I think it, it's fantastic. I think it would be great if you make sure that everybody has the ability to reach out to you. As I said, when you have a technician like, like Ben available, uh, I think we need to be, be using a guy like this on, on a regular basis and, and realizing the, the artistry that this guy can bring to it. It, it is different. You know, I've had wax ups done from different labs and uh, what Ben does is on a, different level and, and the way that you customize and care for the cases that you've shown uh the 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 specific details that you put into each tooth just incredible and 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 one of the things i really liked was and, and that really hit home with me was and and the way i like to refer to it is talking about things being perfectly imperfect and i think that that gets lost so much Mm -hmm. with uh in today's day and age everybody wants these or you know everybody thinks that what people want are these these perfect uh porcelain white chiclets and and it's really it's not when you when you talk to your patients and again another point that ben brought up which is so important is you know what what you may get from a patient may be different from what we get from patients as we know what what the patients will say to our assistant and what they'll say to us can be two very different things so it's important to to bring our lab into the fold and have them being involved with with the treatment plan and the mock-up and and that way everybody's going to be happy and i think hearing it from somebody else such as ben saying you know what we're not going to make your teeth 100 percent perfect we're going to make them realistic and and you have that amazing ability to do that uh, so yeah kudos to you ben uh, i really was impressed with what uh, what you showed and again, that's a nice thing, right, about like these aesthetic diagnostic wax up, you know, you can at least show before even starting the case. I mean, yes, of course, it might cost a little bit more, but, you know, it gets that out of the way and gives a patient peace of mind, you know, like, okay, well, you know, that's what a real tooth would look like. Um, right. It might be too discolored. Can we do a bit whiter, you know? And then by all means, we, we can give that more Hollywood look and um, that, that's not a problem, right? Um, again, you know, it's not about being hard ass right and then yeah. trying to shove something um uh, down you know um for us for our dental you know our clinicians clinicians or patients and but it's about listening and um, to everybody involved you know and trying to work as a collaborative team really um you know to serve the patient best excellent somebody asked here uh ben what uh with the last case you showed what did uh what did you use for composite for the uh for the pink tissue um this was um uh from annex dent it was annex gum okay uh i noticed there was a case you did um that that was interesting it was a four unit bridge which was incredible in terms of the aesthetics and i think you mentioned you went from uh tooth to implant to tooth uh is that correct uh yeah it was not a bridge it was um it was a so, uh, I can go back to it. You want me to go back to it? Sure. Let's go back to that. Um, now, you know, was there concern in terms of going tooth to implant to tooth? I know they, you know, as dentists, we're, we're certainly concerned about that because of the biomechanics uh, of, of the difference in terms of a periodontal ligament to an implant that is integrated into bone. You're going to get different movement. Um, that, With that being said, uh, uh -huh. I have uh, <laughs> I've done it myself, even though it's yeah. probably not uh, not necessarily recommended. Yeah, you mean this case, right? Uh, sorry, I'm just pulling it back up. Yeah, correct. Yeah, this um, this actually was not a bridge. Um, maybe I was uh, miss I miss uh, okay spoke um, or it didn't come through enough. The central um, is um, actually a single crown. It's not connected to the lateral. Okay. Okay. Um, All right. So my the lateral, mistake, it's yeah. a it's basically a two unit splinted case, uh, the lateral to the canine, um, right. the canine being the implant and the lateral being the cantilever contact, and then the bicuspid yep. behind it, you can see in the um, the pick in the bottom corner, um, it's a, a monolithic um, zirconia crown. Okay. 
And okay. So yeah, so I, again, I agree with what you're saying, you know, like we have done a handful of cases too, where, you know, some, for whatever reason we have done, you know, engage the tooth born, the bite, right. let's say as well. Um, but right. And, and sometimes, you know, we, we have to be willing to take some, some risks and, and try some different things as long yeah. as uh, it's informed consent and our, our patients understand what we're doing and exactly. that it's not necessarily a textbook, but that's okay. You know, yeah. I mean, don't, don't be a cowboy, but uh, if you want to try something and the patient understands what's going on, I think there's, there's no problem with that. Um, another, another example too, you know, with lithium silicate, you know, where they, it's contraindicated to use it in bridge work in the posterior and we right. have done bridge work in the posterior. Um, but we right. had like, oodles of room, like two plus millimeters occlusally, you know, and the connectors were super strong and the, the actual crown walls were super strong. There was nothing thin. And, you know, then you can get away with stuff like that, right? Also, yeah, you know, yeah. if it's not a clench of a bruxer, you know, then, then it works. Right, right. Uh, a couple other questions here, Ben. Let me uh, read this one out to you. Um, which of the following do you, is least radio opaque when taking a bite wing x-ray? Zirconia, metal zirconia, Gold, palladium, lithium, silicon. Least radio opaque. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can I can step in here and help. Yeah, there maybe you step there. I, I mean, zir least. zirconia and, and metal um, yeah. are are essentially uh, completely yeah. radio uh, non radio opaque, which means exactly. they don't show up at all. You're just going to see white. Yeah. Uh, gold, palladium, I would assume uh, you you cannot. Uh, see through lithium silicate is pretty much the only one that you can see yeah. through, which is a really nice benefit from being a CAD CAM dentist myself. Uh, that's one of the huge benefits of of using lithium right. uh, lithium silicate or lithium disilicate is, you know, you can see your preps, you can see recurrent decay, you can see open margins. Whereas with metal crowns, even zirconia, you don't see anything. So yeah. it, it's really it's guesswork with what is underneath there. Right. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I mean, you have to pick and choose as, as we all know, uh, just because you have a hammer doesn't mean everything's a nail, right? You have right. to, you have to know which material is appropriate for each case. And that's where, you know, using a guy like Ben and, and having that discussion with him and, and Ben obviously uh, understands the, the materials quite well, and he's going to give you his recommendation. And, and it's important to just to do that. I mean, I'm sure it puts you in a tough position at times, Ben, where, where a dentist will say, well, I want this material. And you can sit there and say, uh, and hopefully you have that relationship with your dentist where you can say, um, you know, okay, what about we use this material? It might be a better, better option in this situation. Um, exactly. So it's important to have that relationship with your lab. And I certainly, as a dentist, I, 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 encourage, uh, I encourage you all as dentists to, to have that open communication with your lab because they are a, a huge wealth of knowledge. And especially when you have, uh, you know, lab techs like, like Ben who, who have done the work and, and are as passionate about their profession as, as we are. Right. And that's why I mentioned in the beginning there, you know, it's people that we work with. It's about relationships. It's not just, you know, trying to grab another client for the sake of having another client that we can get work from, you know, it's, and really trying to build a long lasting collaborative relationship. And, and most of our clients by now, um, they'll send the case to us without even um, the material choice. They'll just say, right. evaluate it, get back to me, see what you think, and we'll go from there. Right, right. Um, another question here, let me, uh, let me ask you here, Ben. Um, your view on translucent zirconia, mm -hmm. uh, long-term successes of, of pectin for fixed cases uh and given given the higher elastic uh, modulus um so that's kind of like a two-part question um yeah zirconia translucent zirconia um so far we've had great results again um like with you you i assume you're referring to because it's weaker uh or what I what's the question yeah, based yeah. around yeah, that's what they're referring to because it's weak this is from ziad ziad did you ask this one uh, Not like it was sent, yeah, it was just uh, sent to me um, um, anonymously. So. Right. Okay. So you know, I don't know exactly what they're referring to. I don't know whether they're referring to the different types of zirconia. You know, yeah. the the Y five. You know. Yeah. Um, so you know, in terms so, of the strength, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So so translucent zirconia. The more translucent zirconia is, generally speaking, well, it was up until I would say recently. I would almost you know. Um, that the more translucent zirconia became, the weaker it also became. 
we cannot necessarily be a bad thing um, because it's still, you know, let's say 500 to 600 megapascals strong. So that's still plenty strong. Um, but um, yeah. it was also more prone to chipping um, because basically in order to make it more translucent, they lost strength. Right. Um, higher strength. So, I mean, I, I talk about this, uh, this question a fair bit too, actually, mm -hmm. uh, Ben, you know, I mean, you know, Katana is kind of the, the leader in the field right now in terms of millable zirconias, which is mm -hmm. a fantastic material. And I'm a huge fan of Katana, <laughs> you know, and, and everybody wanted stronger, stronger, stronger. But the question becomes, which is, is strength really what we're looking for in, in that case? And I exactly. think your, uh, when you talked about it, you know, when you talked about feldspathic porcelain, um, you know, when I first started with Ceric Dentistry, that's all I had. And I was using Vita Mark II across exactly. the board. And right. I still have thousands of Vita Mark IIs in the mouth. And, and you know, uh, I know you mentioned it was about 90 megapascals. And I, I actually, the Vita Mark II that I'm milling is is uh you know 140 in that range of megapascals so yeah i was talking know, about that, like you know when you lay it on refractor you know like right well and that's very hand. true right when you were using it in terms of pfms i mean that's where it always breaks in the past is you know the interface between the porcelain and the metal whereas if right. we're using a, a a monolithic type feldspathic porcelain you're getting 140 megapascals and these things i have thousands of them in the mouth before the materials got better and better and they didn't, they haven't failed. They're beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, the aesthetics are incredible. Um, now that doesn't mean I use them for posteriors or anything. I use other materials because you know, I want to advance with the, the technology, but I still will use it in the anterior for certain aesthetic cases because it, you don't need the, the force strength. There's no point in using uh, a zirconia in the anterior. If, uh, if you feel you can get better aesthetics in, in using uh, a feldspathic or an Emax, a lithium disilicate, or a right. you know, or a lithium silicate, so so I don't know if uh, if that's what that question is referring to in terms of the uh, the translucent ones. But certainly, as we get into the shaded ones, they tend to get a little bit weaker. Um, but that doesn't that's and not necessarily a bad thing. To get into a bit more material science, I mean, zirconia. I don't know how much people know about hey, it. Guys, it I got to chip in. Sorry, uh, we're running out of time. We're like oh, still yeah, no into problem, questions lecture. So if you guys have any other questions to answer, I didn't want to be rude, but you got to cut in. Um, just email our team at DT Academy, and we will get the answer directly to you. Sorry, guys, I'm such a bummer. No, that's fine, Mark. Uh, but again, yeah, thank you very, very much, Ben. Uh, fantastic work, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to seeing more of you and seeing more of your work. And uh, I look forward to working with you myself. Thank you very much. Take it away, Mark. See, I do there. You want to turn your yeah. All right, cool. So we're, we're just going to go straight into the next one. Yeah, let's do it. All right, sounds good. Um,